of Chicago. As part of the 150th anniversary of women at Yale, I'm honored to speak with Dr. Janet Yellen, PhD in economics, 1971, about economic policy and inequality in America today. In addition to being a, an academic, I'm a health economist as well, and so I'm really excited to have this conversation with you, Dr. Yellen. Thank you for joining us. Thanks. Um, I want to start off uh, First of all, with a very brief introduction, I know most people know your bio and I don't want to spend too much of our time on that. Uh, Dr. Yellen is a distinguished fellow in residence at the Brookings Brookings Institution, but of course, as, as I'm sure you know, she previously served as chair of the Federal Reserve Board from, nine, from 2014 to 2018. She was the first woman in that role and played a crucial role in monetary policy in the US, so welcome. Thanks so much, Kate. It's a pleasure to be with you. So I want to jump right in. Before talking about the economic crisis that we're experiencing today in the US let's and around the world, I want to start with the pre-pandemic economy and ask you about the trends that we saw there. By so many measures, we were undergoing a wonderful economic boom before the pandemic. Unemployment rates were at historic lows of 3.5%. Inflation was under control. It sounds like a golden era of prosperity. But underneath those aggregate numbers, there was a huge widening of income inequality in the US based on gender, geography, race, and ethnicity. It really seemed like the economic gains were concentrated at the top of the income distribution with a lot of people left behind. Why do you think that was? What was going on in our economy? Well, that's a, that's a great question. Let me say by way of background that I became interested in macroeconomic policy during my time at Yale, I had the good fortune to study with James Tobin, who was a Nobel Prize winning economist and a leading Keynesian economist. And um, what I learned at Yale or came to believe was that sound macroeconomic policies devoted to the objectives of full employment and low and stable inflation, which is what the Fed's goals are, that um, if they were successful, they would improve the lives of um, everyone throughout the nation. And I thought of that as happening through two channels. First, that um, if we could reduce the size and magnitude of business cycle fluctuations, that would mean that uh, many people could spare the, the difficult disruptions that occurred in their lives when they lose jobs during recessions or, in worst cases, situations like the Great Depression. And second, I thought that policies that promote long-term growth, which a stable macro environment should, would help lift living standards of most Americans and bring broad-based benefits. Well, I got my PhD in 71, so it's almost 50 years later. And that goal of full employment, I still see that as important. Economic downturns really harm low-income workers and minorities most. We, we saw that in 2008 when the economy suffered a great recession, and we see that in spades now. This pandemic-induced downturn is taking a huge toll on minorities and less skilled workers, particularly women. But what's changed since the 1970s is that the benefits of growth no longer seem like they're broadly shared. Um, until the early 80s, from, during the post-war period, economic growth was accompanied by earnings gains for US workers at all education levels and both for women and men. And the American dream seemed very much to be alive. Um, roughly 90% of children who were born uh, in the cohort of 1940 earned more than their parents when they became adults. But sometime during the 1980s, that really changed. 
an economic growth in the U.S. stopped translating into widely distributed gains. So this idea that a rising tide would lift all boats, which once was true, it seems like it stopped being true sometime in the 1980s. The most educated adults, those with college and graduate degrees, saw solid earnings growth. But for those without college degrees, um, for men um, who were working full time, weekly earnings, uh, for those without a college degree, weekly earnings adjusted for inflation were actually 10 or 20 percent below their levels for de decades earlier. So 40 years of, of negative progress. Women did a little bit better. Their wages simply stagnated. And minority workers were very hard hit. Now, you know, I was at the Fed and I served as chair during the recovery from the Great Recession. The job market tightened, as you mentioned. Unemployment fell to 50-year lows. And we did see a small turnaround for people at the bottom of the income distribution because very tight labor markets do bring benefits in the form of wage increases for less skilled workers. But that wasn't close to sufficient to offset this long-term secular decline starting from the 1980s. And another thing that we have seen since the... 1980s or in recent decades is we have parts of the country that are faring very well. Superstar cities, New York, San Francisco, LA, highly educated workers, knowledge centers, um, solid job opportunities, high wages. But rural areas and many older metropolitan areas, New Haven in some ways was long an example of this really saw economic stagnation and declining employment. And many of these communities are in acute distress. Once upon a time, less skilled workers could leave those places and go to these superstar cities and get a wage premium. Um, but that stopped being the case in recent decades. And um, the other thing is the American dream looks like it's all but died. Intergenerational mobility um, is greatly diminished. So people don't feel like their kids are getting ahead and having better lives. So what caused all of this? The two leading culprits are technological change that's been biased in favor of skilled workers and globalization and particularly the rise in trade with China. But most important, technological change has contributed to a disappearance of long-term jobs that have decent wages and benefits for those who don't have a college education. The new technologies have benefited skilled workers, um, but they replaced less skilled workers in many jobs, with the exception of those that require um, personal interaction, face-to-face -face contact. You know, particularly in manufacturing, um, where there were good jobs, that became the foundation for meaningful lives for many less skilled workers. They ended up being replaced largely by service sector jobs that often lack benefits like health care and, pe and pensions and are quite insecure. Firms, even domestically, have outsourced lower level, level jobs. And so the connections that firms had to, to um, that workers had to their firms um, have eroded in many cases. Once upon a time, you would hear stories about how an employee who started off as an elevator operator or emptying waste baskets would rise to CEO. And the truth is that really is barely possible anymore. Um, and I think more important, the deterioration in the job market has caused many prime age men and women without a college degree to just drop out of the labor force. Um, the 
for both men and women, there's been a long secular decline in labor force participation. And the social and cultural implications have been really far reaching. We've seen a breakdown in marriage and family stability of ties between men and their children, the breakdown of community and loss of a sense of meaning in life and dignity is something that really goes beyond money and has led to a sense of despair. Um, poor prospects also make it harder to send kids to college. We're seeing a divide in which the richest families tend to raise children within intact marriages, spending enormous resources on them. And the bottom two thirds of the population in the, in the education distribution have more than half their children outside of marriage and are, are able to spend very little on enrichment. So this gap in spending per child is just serving to widen inequality over time. And finally, in this list of dreadful developments, I have to mention health and mortality trends. Very important work by Angus Deaton and Ann Case at Princeton. They coined the term deaths of despair to characterize uh, what we're seeing, which is rising mortality among non-college educated white men and women due to drugs, um, particularly the opioid epidemic, alcohol and suicide. And that really shows that there has been um, a breakdown of, uh, it's not just income, but also a sense of meaning in life. Well, you've highlighted some really troubling trends and, of course, the intertwined outcomes of economic well-being and health and the deaths of despair that we're seeing highlight disparities in life expectancy and health and well-being that are mirroring the widening disparities in income. And you're talking about the pre-pandemic period when, of course, this year we've seen this catastrophic health risk that's felt very unequally across the income distribution, coupled with you know, a huge rise in unemployment that again is concentrated in the lower end of the income distribution. So how do you see the pandemic affecting inequality? And do you think that it'll have long-term adverse consequences or is this you know, a, a terrible blip and you expect us to return to trends as troubling as those prior trends might be? So I'm afraid this is an unhappy conversation. I wish I could say something that was hopeful and optimistic here. But as you noted, the pandemic has really taken things from bad to worse for minorities and low income workers. It's created yet greater challenges for low income communities because the pandemic has just disproportionately resulted in job loss for less educated workers in the service sector. And health-wise, of course, these are the same individuals who are most exposed to the virus, um, less able to, given the way they live and the fact that many are essential workers, less able to engage in social distancing. D you know, downturns in the labor market always have the biggest negative effect on less skilled workers and minorities. But in the case of the pandemic, it has been incredibly concentrated on exactly those workers. Um, all sectors of the economy have been hit, but it is these consumer facing service sectors where less skilled workers and minorities are highly represented. Just to give you a sense, um, less than a third of upper income households reported any job loss or pay cut after the pandemic hit. But that figure was around a half for lower income households, over 60 percent for Hispanic Americans and 40 percent for black Americans. OK, longer term, you asked what might the consequences be? And I am worried about that because I do see the pandemic as prompting 
a significant restructuring of the economy that's likely to affect less skilled workers negatively. I'm focused on the fact that um, firms are likely to shift to having a larger share of work done from home. Partly because of that shift, urban areas are likely to become less dense. Employment's less likely to, uh, to become less concentrated in large firms. It's smaller firms that will fail in greater numbers. And finally, I think the pandemic will intensify firms' investments in automation, which will lead to less employment. All of these trends seem likely to diminish the demand for less skilled workers. And um, it's exactly that trend over decades since the 1980s that's been responsible for rising inequality. Just to draw that out a little bit, if the share of work done from home um, remains a lot higher and there's a lot less business travel post-pandemic, the demand for cleaning, security, maintenance crews in buildings, hotel workers, restaurant staff, drivers will shrink. But services of the type I just mentioned make up a large and rising share of employment among workers with a high school education or less. They account for about a quarter of all U.S. jobs. Um, we're likely to see a wave of retail bankruptcies that will diminish sales employment, which is uh, another area with um, where less skilled workers um, are represented. And finally, I'd say that I think the pandemic is, is incenting firms to try to put in place technologies that let them accomplish their core tasks with less human beings. Fewer workers in stores, fewer security guards, more automation in warehouses. It's incenting them to substitute robots for people. Um, there might be one trend that goes in a more favorable direction for less skilled workers, and that's that we've had huge amounts of global outsourcing. And we saw that that compromised resilience in the crisis. There was great disruption of global supply chains. And so there may be a reshoring of activity that's been outsourced, and that could be a positive. But on balance, if you ask me what I, what I think the pandemic will do longer term, it's reduce the number of jobs for less skilled workers. And, you know, these in many cases aren't the greatest jobs in the world. Um, so they aren't what we would call good jobs. But the truth is having too few of them is, is the worst thing that I can imagine. Well, with only a minute left, I want to ask you just one small question, which is, what should we do about it, either through fiscal policy or monetary policy? What can public policy do to help reverse this trend? So with a minute, let me try to be quick about it. Monetary policy is doing about everything that it can. Um, short rates are effectively zero. Longer term interest rates are the lowest level in U.S. history. There are emergency facilities the Fed has set up to lend. Fiscal policy has to play a role. It started off well with the CARES package, which was very large, and it was both relief to the people and the small businesses that were most affected and also stimulus for the economy so that we didn't just see the problems spread throughout the economy. Uh, it, very important was um, an extra $600 a, a week that was given to people um, getting unemployment insurance, and that group was um, increased substantially. But that's ended. State and local governments also face huge um, budget deficits. And um, we've been hoping, I've been hoping for another package, and it doesn't seem to be in the offering, in the offing. Longer term, this is a huge topic. 
We have about 30 seconds left, so let me say education, education, education at all levels from um, early childhood through um, college education. Clearly, having a college degree is important. We need to make sure people can access college. But there also needs to be a rewarding working life for people who don't get a college degree. You see that in many countries in Europe, um, it's certainly possible to have alternative pathways. There's a lot to say on this topic. I'll just say that I think community colleges could play a more important role than they do now. They're well suited to offer um, the kind of training that would be helpful. Um, but I think they, their resources need to be bolstered. I think I'm also in favor of raising the minimum wage. It's been done in many states. I think it would be beneficial to do it nationally. The earned income tax credit could be expanded. We need a better social safety net. So a um, lot to say on those topics, but let me stop there. Well, I'm so grateful to have had this chance to learn from your experience and insights. And I know that the audience joins me in thanking you for that. And perhaps ending on the note of the importance of education is fitting for our setting and our, our shared background. And I want to thank you for your time and thank our audience for tuning in. Thanks so much. Pleasure to be with you, Kate.